Awesome. All right. Good to meet everyone. Sorry if it gets a little dark here. The sun isn't up here yet. <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about testing. Uh, so first, my name is Goku Mohandas, and as Jesper mentioned, um, I'm the founder of Made with ML. Uh, really quick about my background, uh, backgrounds in biology slash chemical engineering. So used to be a scientist, Mike, and then kind of transitioned to more on the applied side. Um, now doing a combination, actually. Uh, started up my career building a rideshare analytics app when uh, Uber and Lyft first started out, uh, but to help kind of the taxi sectors uh, combat against them. Uh, then went on to work at Apple, uh, mostly doing NLP and then building out their sort of initial ML platforms, kind of standardized that now. Uh, was there about three years uh, and then transitioned back to health, uh, left with the head of Apple Health um, to start a company in the oncology space. Um, and then we were there for about two years. And then after uh, the acquisition of that company, I had two, con two different contexts of applying machine learning in production. Um, and I kind of just wanted to share what that looked like. So that was how uh, Made with ML started. Um, and it's a completely free open source resource for people to learn about how to put machine learning into production. And I cover all the topics kind of from first principles. So it's not catered to just my specific context. Uh, but I've been meet, getting to meet a lot of amazing people who are, you know, developing contexts that I'll personally never touch, uh, just for being one of them. So uh, it's become a great kind of medium for myself as well. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it short so we can get back on time. Uh, but I will be talking about uh, testing. And instead of making slides, I thought we can just quickly go through um, the actual content on Made with ML. So let me get that for you guys. Everyone can see my screen. Okay. Uh, so you can go to madewithml.com or, or just search uh, like testing ML. And just I'm going to cover sort of the high level details here. Uh, and I'll paste the links at the end as well. But um, I think we're going to have a discussion at the end. So any questions, let's let's push them to that. And I'll answer them on the chat as well. Um, but I think when people talk about testing machine learning systems, um, there's a lot of overlap with the testing that we've had with software 1.0, which I'll call you know deterministic software. Uh, and there's a lot we can kind of take from that. But there are a lot of extensions that we can't directly uh, take from that world as well mostly because of these other components, right? Software 1.0 has code, but now we have these probabilistic artifacts centered around data and models itself. So there's some changes that we need to make uh, when we think about how we should test these different artifacts. Um, so I always start out with kind of an intuition and the different types of uh, hi there. things like that. Uh, hi there, can we just make the font a bit bigger? Is that possible? Sure, yeah, I'll just zoom in, how's that? Excellent, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Um, by the way, so for all the lessons, we, it's following a full end-to-end uh, -end course here. Um, but obviously, some people just come in to learn about a specific piece of content. So uh, most of the lessons have a kind of a standalone repository and notebook that you guys can explore as well. But I think it's better to see everything in the context of the larger project. Uh, it, it'll just fill in more of the missing pieces. But I'm going to skip through some of the intro stuff here. Uh, obviously, this you guys can go check out the lesson, but we talk about the different types of tests. This directly correlates to the machine learning uh, world as well. Um, you know, how you should be testing, uh, you know, basically setting up things that you want to be testing and then actually putting them into the different components that you are actually testing and then asserting that the outputs are what you're expecting. And there's so many different tools out there, right? These are just for Python because we're using Python in, in the course here. But uh, I think every single major language has testing utilities out there. Um, I'm going to quickly gloss over the best practices. We're actually going to do each of these as I talk about the code, data, and models. Um, but there are, I, I feel, sort of industry best practices when it comes to how you should set up your testing. Start by testing the smallest unit of code first. So it's really good to create small uh, functions with single responsibilities and then test those individual pieces, but also test as you start to combine different functions and classes together. So testing at kind of all different layers there um, and how to kind of keep your tests up to date and coverage and things like that. So uh, we'll, we'll look at quick examples. Um, so first, obviously testing code itself, even though this is machine learning and probabilistic components, those probabilistic components come out of deterministic code that we're writing. Um, so we use PyTest for the course here, but they all start with kind of the major principles, right? Having uh, assertions, about how your piece of code should run. Um, I always start off with kind of simple examples. And then in the actual course, you know, you can, we have more uh, how it, look, what it looks like in the context of machine learning. So let's say you have a function called uh, just, you know, getting certain metrics or calculating certain metrics. 
you probably want to assert that the, that custom function you wrote actually behaves the way that you do. If you're using something like scikit-learn, for example, uh, to you know calculate the F1 score, these functions have all been tested on their backend, right? So you can reliably use them. When you're writing your own functions, let's say for custom metrics or anything custom that you're doing, you're going to want to do the same so that one, that you can trust it. Uh, and number two, hopefully you're building something reusable for other people in your team to build other applications on top of. So if you can have kind of a central repo, if you will, that's always made of tested components, then people can quickly build their applications knowing that it's that it's uh, that they can trust the pieces of code that, that are written. Different granularities to run these tests, obviously. I'm going to skip through the code part pretty quickly, too, so we can get to the data and models. Um, but you can similarly test not just functions, but classes as well. Um, there's very efficient ways to kind of set up initial values for the classes so you aren't setting them over and over. The big components I wanted to cover for testing code uh, that extend to <clears throat> kind of testing uh, the ML artifacts as well are around parametrization. So you don't want to keep saying, uh, you know, testing... Uh, the logic, writing the testing logic over and over. So you just want to specify a bunch of inputs and the expected outputs, and you can just write the logic once and it'll iterate over uh, the different inputs and outputs that you're wanting to test. So the example for, you know, the machine learning use case here, uh, here, let's say you have a pre-processing function. I don't want to keep writing, this is the input, pre-process it, is it equal to the output? I'll just write down a bunch of inputs and outputs, and I'll just let this uh, parametricize over these uh, different inputs and outputs. Um, let's see, let's keep going on to, so there's obviously a lot more smaller details into how to do this really well. There's a concept called coverage, which I think I should definitely talk about. People always strive for hundred percent coverage. And that doesn't always mean testing every single line in your repository. That just means that you've accounted for every single line. And there are some lines that just don't make sense to test. And when you run, let's say a coverage report on top of PyTest, you don't have to have tested every piece, um, but you should know what you're not explicitly testing. Um, and usually those are around kind of, uh, you know, setting variables and things like that. But there's ways you can have 100% coverage, uh, but knowing that you've covered all the important bits and excluding the parts that, you know, don't necessarily need to be tested, for example, or that you want to cover later. Okay, so let's get into the, the meat of it now. So uh, after code, <clears throat> I want to quickly talk about testing data and the models itself. Again, um, the best teams that I've seen in this space uh, used to have custom scripts for testing their data artifacts. And uh, today there's a bunch of awesome libraries. There's Great Expectations, which is more for testing uh, data itself, not just specifically for the machine learning context, but for um, just any kind of data pipeline, uh, usually happens in the ELT stack actually. And there's other more ML specific libraries and there's Soda, there's Deep Checks, a few others as well. Um, but I use Great Expectations, I've been using them for uh, almost four years now so and they've naturally kind of grown into satisfying a lot of the requirements for machine learning use cases as well but the great thing about using a library like this um, or write, writing your own script is that you basically just take your data set um, and you can for example with here you encapsulate it uh, using the great expectation abstraction and with this you get a lot of uh, out of the box type of expectations so with code we wrote we designed the expectations but with data you know regardless of the modality or uh, the dimensionality, we can. there are a lot of out-of-the-box expectations you can have. So let's look at a few of them, because even in our data set here, you have some categorical variables, you have some unstructured data, um, you, you can even have, you know, let's say, floating points, et cetera. So um, the notion is called expectations here, similar to assertions, but the out-of-the-box ones are, are really, uh, and they're growing as well, but, uh, you know, a few simple ones for our data set you want to make sure, for example, that the actual columns you expect in your data set are actually there. You want to maybe see that there's no data leaks inserted, right? I, I think I heard every speaker kind of talk about this already. So it's very important. The data leak here could be as simple, simple as making sure that every combination of a title and description are actually unique. So uh, this is great. You should probably apply this to even all your data splits as well to make sure that there's no, uh, the same sample is not accidentally inserted into the different splits. Uh, missing values, unique values, making sure the certain types, uh, all the certain features of a certain type, making sure that, you know, for if you have a categorical variable, for example, that they come from a, a predefined list maybe that you have and there aren't any new classes. Um, so all of these are very contextual. Um, the Great Expectations website has a lot of um, out-of-the-box uh, tests that you can have, but they also make it very easy to write your custom tests as well. Um, that becomes really useful because, you know, machine learning is completely contextual and 
you'll want to, you will be writing your own tests as well, but they provide the framework. So you don't have to make it a custom script. You can, it'll just be, you know, two, three lines of Python and you can insert it. So writing these tests are great. And obviously you can run these tests, um, but these need to be organized, right? You can't just keep running them one ad hoc and you certainly can't be expected everyone, you can't expect everyone to run this every time. So um, the best practices that I've seen are actually to organize this. Usually tests should be split based on kind of table wide uh, expectations and maybe column wide expectations. You can have different types as well, but these are the two main classes. And once you have that, you want to create something called uh, like a suite. Um, this is an abstraction that they have, but an uh, easier way of thinking about it would be I have a data set and I have a set of expectations that I have that that those collection of expectations will grow over time. Um, you can call that a suite and you're going to apply that suite on this data set, but you may also apply to other data sets that maybe share the same features, right? So uh, it's not always one to one. Um, and a collection of suites will make a project. So for my this data science project, these are all the different collection of tests that I have. And those will grow over time. And uh, you know, a tool like Great Expectations makes it really easy to actually connect to different data sources. So maybe in the beginning, it's a single file like a CSV, but eventually maybe you're connecting directly to the database or the data warehouse. So you can set all these connections up uh, and you can have these suites execute every time you make a change to a code or every time there's a new, uh, let's say, new version of the data coming in. And you want these, you can actually automate these to run on your pipelines as well. So just a very powerful tool. Um, I think a lot of the tools today around testing enable this kind of um, orchestration. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention about this is uh, um, in the course, right, uh, testing is something that you do regularly, but it's it's hard to teach something that you do cyclically in a linear fashion. Uh, but I, I do talk about what this looks like in production. M after kind of V1, maybe you're testing on the data set that you have right now. That's not where most teams actually have their tests. The, the most mature teams actually put their tests um, at, at a much earlier point. So oh, by the way, great expectation, there's also a lot of documentation that's generated as well. So in production, this is actually what it looks like. So instead of testing in your in your specific machine learning repository, you're going to want, want to put the bulk of the testing way, way upstream because your one machine learning application at this point is not going to be the only consumer of that data. So it makes sense to have a lot of the validation happen way upstream. For example, right after you extract it from the actual source, maybe you have some tests that need to pass. After it's being ingested, you know, using a tool like uh, Air, uh, Airbyte or Fivetran into a warehouse, for example, maybe another couple tests are executed. After you apply some transform transformations, maybe other tests are also applied. So you have tests kind of uh, applied after each stage in the ELT stack, way, way upstream. And now, uh, you know, my machine learning application, your machine learning application, maybe they all share the same data source, for example, we can all benefit from these tests that have already uh, run for us and have run way upstream. We can, you can just kind of look at the reports. And obviously our two applications may have additional tests as well. So those then you can run in your specific repository uh, if it doesn't make sense for everyone or you need certain things to look a certain way. So um, in general, every time there's a movement or transformation, it's a good idea to place a test there uh, because some things are just not in your control. And uh, unfortunately, not uh, not everything is fully communicated. So uh, this is a great way to catch issues before you know they happen much further downstream. Okay, I think we just have like a few more minutes. Real quick about models. Um, even We're though we're running uh, out of time, data, but yes. Okay, we have okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> with models, I, I kind of split it into uh, three different categories here. So, um, what does testing models look like for uh, training, um, and then the actual model itself, and then for inference. So. For training, uh, you know, the actual process of training, maybe you want to check things like the shapes and values of the intermediate and the ultimate outputs from your model. You want to check, you know, perhaps during uh, a single batch that the loss is actually decreasing across the different iterations. Uh, this is a really good one that I think a lot of people don't do, but it's very easy to do. Just overfit on a batch, right? Any kind of model that you're developing here, you should be able to overfit performance on test set may not be great, but that's okay. You're just testing that the logic works um, uh, in terms of actually producing uh, the uh, kind of the loss and, and the pattern of loss there. Train to completion, obviously, actually, you know, run through and make sure things like early stopping and saving mechanisms, all those things work. Um, and this is a big one. Make sure it works on different devices. You know, maybe if you're doing something small scale locally, but then your your actual production will run on TPUs or GPUs, run, run the tests on that. And um, there's amazing tools coming out 
you know, th this year actually, and I'm sure next couple of years as well, that make this switch of context very easy. So it's not, you know, a completely different style of work for you to write scripts on the cloud or run the same tests. Uh, it's becoming sort of like the infinite laptop, if you will. So a lot of amazing work happening in the testing space. Um, and again, uh, in the in the course, we apply a lot of the concepts from the code in, in the modeling here as well to make it <clears throat> more streamlined. There's also the concept of uh, you know actually testing your model itself, and this domain is huge, right? It depends on your model, the, the, your specific application. Our task is NLP here, um, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this uh, you know behavioral testing for NLP models. There's kind of three big pillars here, right? Uh, invariance uh, <clears throat> here, basically any change that I do. It's uh, the type of change it shouldn't affect the output. So, for example, if I change uh, this these words here, for example, transformers applied to NLP have blanked the ML field. For my task, these things shouldn't change the output. And again, I say for my task because if your task is something else where these should change the output, then this is not invariance. But um, these are just different types of tests that I write for the model itself. And if you notice here, it doesn't matter what the model is here, right? The model could be deep learning, could be rule-based, could be anything. These types of tests are agnostic to the actual model itself. Um, and they, you should, they should be always passing. So almost like sanity checks here that you want to insert. And again, these can be part of your actual testing suite so that they're all being run every time I make an update. And these aren't things I'm running manually. Um, and obviously a lot of adversarial testing you can do as well. Um, and then once you have these kinds of tests, again, we parametricize these so you can run them uh, pretty easily. Once you're done with uh, you know, the training bit, the actual model bit, the last big section is around the actual inference. You want to be, you, want, you should test that you're actually able to load the different artifacts that you've created. You should be able to test that you can run simple predictions. Um, and you know, let's say if it's, a, if it's a REST service here that actually goes through. Um, and we use Makefile to orchestrate all this, but later on in the course, we uh, actually use, you know, for example, Airflow to make sure these things actually run and GitHub CI CD to enforce that they run without us manually executing the tests. Um, but okay, so uh, that's like a quick whirlwind tour of uh, testing. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more ties to testing around monitoring, et cetera. Um, I'm happy to answer a lot of questions. I'll, I'll paste the links right now as well for all of this, but um, definitely check out uh, the course as well. It's it's all free, it's open source, and I keep it up to date as I, I, I work with a lot of companies in different industries now um, and different scales as well. And I keep this stuff up to date in a way that speaks to all the contexts. Um, and then obviously everything has code as well. So I think it's really important to implement these things so you can see what it looks like in practice. All right, I'll stop the share now and I'll, I'll share the resources and I'll, I'll start answering questions as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I think we'll go over to, uh, Gemma right away, but yeah, this is amazing. And I think also the code examples that you showed were really, really good. Like okay. it's, um, that the overfitting tip, I, I think that's one of those secret tips that go around on Twitter and go viral regularly. So that's a really yeah. good one, but yeah, let's give, uh, Gemma the 25 minutes to, to bring us home and. Thank you so much for, for, for showing this amazing resource. Everyone should know that, to be honest. <laughs>